I'm Mary Ann Carter, the Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, and the 198th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now in session. I would like to welcome everyone this morning, council members, <laughs> agency staff, and our hosts here at the Phillips Collection. In particular, Dorothy Kaczynski, the Bradenburg Director and CEO of the Phillips. Thank you so much. We are thrilled to be here at this lovely, lovely venue. I want to thank Dorothy and her entire team for welcoming us. The Arts Endowment is so proud to support this gem of an institution. For the record, the council members who are present are arts researcher Bruce Carter from Miami Beach, Florida, philanthropic professional Deepa Gupta from Chicago, Illinois, attorney, musician, and former congressman Paul Hodes from Concord, New Hampshire, Patron and trustee Charlotte Kessler from Columbus, Ohio. Arts administrator Maria Lopez de Leon from San Antonio, Texas. Organic farmer and author Mas Masamoto Mas, from Delray, California. And visual artist Barbara Ernest Prey from Oyster Bay, New York. Joining us on the phone are Aaron Dworkin, Maria Rosario Jackson, Ronnie Ramaswamy, and Diane Rodriguez. We regret that council members Lee Greenwood, Emil Kang, Rick Lowe, and Tom Rothman are unable to join us this morning. Now, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of our June council meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Now we will move to the council members' votes. I would like to invite Tom Simplot, our senior deputy chairman, to talk us through or to take us through this section of the meeting. Tom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, members of the audience and council members. We will proceed with the application review section of the agenda. The tally of the votes will be announced at the end of today's session. The council will be voting by ballot today on award recommendations totaling more than $31 million in three funding areas, artworks, creative writing fellowships, and national initiatives. These funding recommendations are found in the corresponding sections of your council book. For your vote to be tallied, you must be present at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. On the phone, we have Aaron Dworkin, Maria Rosario Jackson, Renee, Renee Ramaswamy, and Diane Rod uh, Rodriguez. If you are joining us via telephone, you must email your votes to Kim Jefferson in these three funding categories immediately at the conclusion of this part of the meeting. Council members' affiliations are recorded in the council book and will be attached to your ballots and each member has been provided an opportunity to update this information prior to the meeting. Prior, prior to voting, council members should review the list of recommendations and rejections and add to the list uh, provided in your folders any affiliations that may be missing. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated. This list becomes part of the agency's official record. After brief summaries of the three funding areas, council members will have an opportunity to ask questions and or discuss the recommendations before voting by ballot. May I have a motion to consider the recommended grants and rejections under Artworks, Creative Writing Fellowships, and National Initiatives in the Council Book? So moved. Is there a second? Thank you. Now I will summarize the three funding areas on which you will be voting and then pause for any comments or questions from council members. The Artworks category is the agency's primary category of funding for the arts disciplines and encourages and supports the creation of art that meets the highest standards of excellence, public engagement with diverse and excellent art, lifelong learning in the arts, and the strengthening of communities through the arts. Artworks projects recommended today comprise the first group of Artworks applications brought to the Council this fiscal year. The second half will be considered at the March 2020 meeting. In February 2019, the agency received 1,565 eligible applications, requesting more than $77 million in fiscal year 2020 support. Recommended for the Council's approval are 1,045 projects, totaling more than $25 million. Grants are recommended to nearly 67% of all applicants, with amounts ranging from $10,000 to $100,000, and an average grant amount of $24,836. Recommended projects span 15 disciplines and fields. Direct grants are recommended to 50 states, as well as the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Are there any comments or questions from the Council? 
If not, please mark your ballot. The National Endowment for the Arts provides direct support to creative writers and literary translators of distinction through creative writing fellowships. Creative writing fellowships in prose, fiction and creative nonfiction, enable recipients to set aside time for writing, research, travel, and general career advancement. Translation projects enable recipients to translate work from other languages into English. This year, a total of $900,000 is being recommended to 36 writers in creative writing prose and 300,000 to 24 translators to translate works from 14 languages and 19 countries into English. Are there any comments or questions from the council? If not, please mark your ballot. National initiatives support a wide variety of projects of national and field-wide significance. At this meeting, the council is requested to approve funding for six initiatives totaling more than $4 million. Support is requested for the Creative Forces NEA Military Healing Arts Network, which provides creative arts therapies and arts engagement activities in clinical and community settings for service members, veterans, and their families. The Creative Placemaking Technical Assistance Program, designed to provide prospective applicants to and grantees of the Our Town Program assistance in executing creative placemaking projects in rural, tribal, suburban, and urban communities. The Documentary Sustainability Project, a program focused on strengthening the documentary filmmaking field through knowledge exchange, cross-sector collaboration, and research. The production and management of public events for the National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellowship Program, which annually honors American folk and traditional artists or groups of artists for their contribution to our national cultural mosaic. Six recommended projects in National Endowment for the Arts Research Labs which are focused on arts, health, and social emotional well-being, and arts innovation and entrepreneurship. A professional development project from the State Education Agency Directors of Arts Education, which supports a network of arts education directors in state departments of education across the United States. Are there any comments or questions from the council? If not, please mark your ballot. For council members on the phone, you may now email your votes to Kim Jefferson on those three categories. Finally, there are 11 projects in the award update section of the council book. These grants have been awarded under the chairman's delegated authority and are brought to the council's attention at this meeting, but no vote is necessary. Included are 78 arts engagement in American communities program grants totaling $780,000. One chairman's extraordinary action grant five interagency agreements, and four 20% amendments. And that is the conclusion of this report. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I will give some updates now, and I specifically want to talk about um, how we have been reaching out to new audiences. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the National Book Festival. Over Labor Day weekend, we sponsored the Poetry and Prose Stage at the National Book Festival, which is hosted annually by the Library of Congress. Highlights included an appearance by Creative Writing Fellow Julia Alvarez to mark the 25th anniversary of her big read title, In the Time of the Butterflies. A conversation between former U.S. Poet Laureate and Creative Writing Fellow Natasha Trethaway and National Book Award finalist Jenny Shu, and interviews with Poetry Out Loud winners. Our programming was hugely successful. Our panel room holds about 500 people and it was entirely full with a waiting list most of the time or a, a long line outside going snaking down the hallway. But we also reached an entirely new generation of literature lovers. For the very first time, the National Endowment for the Arts sponsored children's programming at the book festival. Not only did we host the panel discussion, How to Raise a Reader, on our main stage, but we also had a wonderful lineup of children's readings and performances in partnership with Imagination Stage. I also had the honor of reading 
Dr. Seuss's Horse Museum, which was published last month. An imagination stage enthralled the audience of all ages with um, visits from actors, storytellers, and musicians performing vignettes from classics like The Very Hungry Caterpillar and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So this was a very special day, and it was another great example of how we're looking to positively impact children beyond the classroom. But positively impacting the lives of children can be challenging, particularly for those touched by the criminal justice system. Right now, we are renewing emphasis on youth in juvenile justice facilities, and we are actively working to increase their access to the arts. Many of these young people come from traumatic backgrounds, even aside from their time in the juvenile justice system. But we know that the arts are a powerful tool for both healing and rehabilitation, and many prison arts programs boast of dramatically lower recidivism rates for their participants. Although we have always supported projects that serve incarcerated youth, this year we have expanded our Shakespeare in American Communities program to specifically target juvenile justice facilities. A partnership between the Arts Endowment and Arts Midwest, Shakespeare in American Communities brings high quality professional productions of Shakespeare to underserved middle and high schools across the country. For the 2019-2020 school year, eight theater companies will also serve youth in these juvenile facilities through activities such as acting workshops, text analysis, theater games, and performances by participating youth. We are very excited about this additional youth program, which will now reach and impact some of our nation's most vulnerable young people. We have also continued our outreach to address the underrepresentation of historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, in grants awarded by the Arts Endowment. The foundation of our outreach efforts are in-person meetings between Arts Endowment staff and HBCU representatives on HBCU campuses, which allow us to learn about the unique arts and culture needs and priorities of each school and to discuss how the Arts Endowment can help support these needs. To date, we've met with 28 HBCUs on their campus. This summer, we also recruited students for our inaugural Arts and Culture Internship for HBCUs. Our three interns attended Alabama A&M University, Bowie State University, and the University of the District of Columbia. As a result of their work, we now have a catalog of arts and culture resources, faculty classes, and program offerings for every HBCU, which will help the agency strategically target outreach as we move forward on this initiative. In September, we also co-hosted a day and a half convening called Dream It, Achieve It, Federal Cultural Funding Opportunities for HBCUs in conjunction with the 2019 annual HBCU Week Conference. The convening raised awareness about career pathways in the arts, humanities, and culture sex sectors, shared information about federal funding opportunities within these sectors, and offered insight on how to create competitive grant applications. We had a great turnout with 45 HBCUs represented. In recognition of our outreach efforts, we received the 2019 White House Initiative on HBCU's Public Partnership Award Federal. As you can imagine, we were very proud to have these outreach efforts recognized. We've made a huge amount of prog progress regarding HBCUs, with more yet to come. And as a wonderful coincidence, later this morning, you will be hearing from Denise Woodard, who is helping represent one of our grantee guest presenters today, the Box Center, but is now currently a student at Howard University here in Washington, D.C. We look forward to hearing from Denise shortly. We also continue to expand Creative Forces, which is our partnership with the Department of Defense and the Department of Veteran Affairs. Creative Forces brings creative art therapies to service members and veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, 
and other psychological health conditions. At this point in time, Creative Forces provides art, music, and dance movement therapies and creative writing instruction at military medical facilities as well as a telehealth program for patients in rural and remote areas. In our latest expansion of Creative Forces, we are bringing telehealth services to three new veteran affairs sites in partnership with the VA's Office of Rural Health. This expansion is intended to reach veterans in remote and rural areas who might not otherwise have access to such services. To help guide us through the program's continued expansion, we've welcomed Melissa Walker as a detail from the Department of Defense to our team. Melissa is a creative arts therapist at Walter Reed, where we first piloted Creative Forces back in 2011. She was a critical force in shaping the hospital's creative arts therapies, which has served as a model for our entire Creative Forces programming. Melissa will be with us for a year, helping us to continue to grow this program. The research component of Creative Forces also continues to grow. To date, we have published 15 research papers on the impacts and benefits of creative art therapies as innovative treatment methods, and seven more articles are pending publication. We are also gleaning best practices from our 10 community connection projects. These projects provide community-based art opportunities for military populations around our clinical sites, which supports current and former creative art therapy patients and their families as they bridge the transition from clinic to community. These best practices will guide us as we work to develop a national subgrant program for community-based military art projects. And speaking of arts and health, I want to update you on a major milestone we've reached with our Sound Health Initiative, launched in 2017 as a partnership between the National Institutes of Health, the Arts Endowment, and the Kennedy Center, Sound Health explores the relationship between music and the brain. The initiative came to being through a great 2015 meeting between renowned opera singer Renee Fleming, who serves an artistic advisor at large for the Kennedy Center, and Dr. Francis Collins, director of the NIH. Their friendship began a unique collaboration between a performing arts organization and a federal scientific agency that has quickly grown in scope. What began as a two-day symposium of panels, workshops, and performances has now grown into a pioneering research program. In September, NIH awarded $20 million, $20 million over five years to support the first research projects for the Sound Health Initiative with funding support from the Arts Endowment. This partnership builds on our ongoing commitment to research about the arts relationship to health and well-being. This is reflected in our research grants portfolio, our research labs program, and in our interagency task force on the arts and human development, which currently includes several participants from NIH. Our agency is extremely proud to contribute to these inaugural research projects which will study how music can potentially treat symptoms related to neurological conditions such as Parkinson's disease or stroke, as well as how music affects brain development in children. So we've been doing a lot of fantastic work and making progress in our mission to serve all Americans everywhere. The other piece of this is making sure that people actually know about all the great work we're doing. We've been doing a lot of outreach to leaders and lawmakers who might be unfamiliar with the agency and who might not realize the role the arts play in their constituencies. As part of this, agency staff have been traveling extensively in an effort to make the agency more easily visible and more readily accessible. Between my travel and staffs, we will hit all 50 states in 2019. We plan to do the same next year. I want to share a few highlights of these outreach efforts. In September, I spoke at the National Speakers Conference in Newport, Rhode Island, which is a gathering of speakers of the House from across the nation, from all the states. This proved to be a wonderful opportunity 
to share how much value the arts in general and the National Endowment for the Arts in particular bring to each and every state in the country. In fact, the state speaker from Alabama, Mac McCutcheon, was so impressed with our work that he has invited me to attend next year's conference, which will be hosted in Alabama. I also recently attended the Western Governors Association Conference in Fargo, North Dakota, where I moderated a panel called Building Culture and Community Through the Creative Arts. It's so important that we reinforce how critical the arts are to every community's overall health and success, rural communities included. Many people I spoke with at the conference were surprised by how much work this agency does in rural communities. On average, nearly 300 agency grants are awarded for activities in rural communities every year. So this was another great way to let people know about our work and the way the agency is here to help and truly help communities reach their full potential. We've also been conducting more congressional outreach and thinking more critically about the ways that our work might al align with members' interests. For example, the members on the Congressional Autism Caucus might not know how beneficial the arts can be for people on the spectrum, or that the Arts Endowment is a longtime supporter of many, many arts organizations for this population, such as the Theater Development Fund and Paper Mill Playhouse. So we are looking to form new connections and forge new relationships on the Hill, at the state level, and beyond. As we move into the presentations today, you'll notice a common theme of workforce development. For too long, the arts have had a bad reputation when it comes to the workforce. The poor, starving artist stereotype doesn't exactly scream financial security or stability. And while we have the data now to prove that this stereotype is rooted in myth, the arts sector, like every other sector, still has its share of professional challenges. Many of these challenges center around how to make the arts and cultural sphere more diverse and more equitable. We are involved with a number of initiatives to address this and hopefully to rectify it to some extent. In the coming weeks, we'll publish an online toolkit for artists with disabilities, providing information about resources and organizations that will help open professional pathways. Historically, people with disabilities haven't had access to the same career opportunities as people without disabilities. Whether this is because of inaccessible facilities or disability benefit earning limitations, or even misconceptions about the skills and talents of people with disabilities. Through our Careers in the Arts Toolkit, we hope to empower individuals with disabilities to explore arts careers and access resources to support their success. The toolkit will also educate arts employers, educators, and grant makers about the critical role they play in fostering disability inclusion and provide them with resources to help them successfully do so. The National Endowment for the Arts is also a long-standing funder of the Association of Art Museum Directors, or AAMD. AAMD has long recognized the need to diversify the workforce of art museums. Minorities currently comprise less than 5% of art museums' professional workforce with even fewer among top management. To expand the pool of qualified professionals, AAMD has built a pipeline program that trains students of color who wish to consider a career in art museums with support from the Arts Endowment. The program includes paid summer internships at museums, face-to-face -face leadership development, and career readiness assistance for all participating interns and professional development training at two gatherings throughout the year. And finally, on May 11th, the Arts Endowment and the Ford Foundation will co-host an Arts and Workforce Development convening in New York. Currently, the performing arts field is filled with well-paid well -paid stagehand, backstage, and techni technical jobs for a skilled workforce. However, these jobs have not traditionally been available for diverse and underrepresented communities. But Roundabout Theater, which is based in New York, has had remarkable success on this front. 
through its Theatrical Workforce Development Program. Inspired by this success, our convening will help theaters around the country gain the knowledge and the partnerships needed to create their own programs to train and develop a diverse theatrical workforce, including outreach to veterans. We'll hear more from Roundabout about their work in just a few minutes. For our first presentation today, we'll hear from Joe Spaulding, President and CEO of the Box Center. Joe is also joined by Corey Evans, the Vice President and Senior Director of Education, and as mentioned previously, former Box Center student Denise Woodard. Located in Boston, the Box Center is one of New England's largest performing arts institutions and produces a range of theater, musical theater, concerts, opera, dance, and comedy performances, all of which are held in the historic Schubert and Wang theaters. But the Box Center takes its offstage work just as seriously and has a number of programs designed to engage the creativity of area residents particularly children. In July, I had the opportunity to visit the Box Center and learn more about its City Spotlights Teen Leadership Programs, which the Arts Endowments proudly supports. These programs not only give teens the opportunities and training needed to open career pathways in the arts, but they empower them to become community leaders regardless of the field they eventually pursue. Here to tell us more, is Joe Spaulding. Joe? Thank you, Marianne. Uh, good morning. I am extremely honored on behalf of my team to be here today, and uh, it was an extreme pleasure to meet our other presenters last night and members of the council for dinner. So it feels like we're all in the home together, which is just great. So as you heard, I'm Josiah Spaulding. I'm the president and CEO of the Box Center, and I've been the CEO there for 33 years. I have with me Corey Evans, who you heard is our vice president and senior director of education for eight years, and you've already heard that Denise Woodward, 19 years old, is our special guest today. Denise is from Dorchester, Mass., and a graduate of Boston Latin Academy. In her first semester at Howard University, studying music business as a capstone scholar which is a merit-based full-ride scholarship. Denise has participated in our City Spotlight's summer leadership program for three consecutive summers, including this past summer. As you heard, who is the Box Center? We are a nonprofit uh, performing arts center in the great city of Boston, and we are the largest in New England. We present over 200 public performances, as you heard, in music, dance, theater, comedy, and family entertainment. But more importantly, for 33 years, we've been providing free education programs for Boston children and families for 33 years. <clears throat> we have three basic premises, principles. We believe that it's a right, not a privilege, for every youth, regardless of skill level and or socioeconomic status, to have a creative life, experience art, and express themselves creatively and develop their own creative capital. Two, we believe that the arts and creativity are essential to a thriving community, robust economy, and future innovation. And three, we believe that our community outreach and education programs develop and celebrate creative thinkers, doers, and leaders at all levels. So what is City Spotlight's leadership program? One, it's our signature program. <clears throat> it offers year-round leadership training through the arts and meaningful youth employment in an intensive youth development program for Boston teens aged 15 to 19. The program is nine years old and has grown from a five-week summer program for over 30 teens who earned a modest stipend to a six- to seven-week program for 60-plus scenes teens earning minimum wage at $12 an hour for 25 hours per week during the summer and approximately 15 teams, teens earning up to 10 hours per week during the school year. Yes, a job. Our audition process does not focus on the abilities of these students in dance, acting, and music, but it focuses on making sure that teens are committed to the arts, social justice issues, and working collaborative to make their communities and neighborhoods a better place. 
In addition, we are committed to providing access to the arts and leadership training opportunities to an underserved population. While the program is not designed specifically to serve at-risk teens, we have a large population of our teens that are at risk, and we've designed our staffing and program structured to support all of our teens through staff training, teen advisory and staff system, advisory system, and a dedicated summer staff position who has specific training in social work, adolescent psychology, and often arts therapy. The program focuses on advocacy, both community and personal advocacy, leadership training and job readiness skills through all music, acting, and dance. Teens select a topic that is important to them. They pick their own topic to start of the summer, which they use to focus all of their work for the summer. This past summer, they selected Media is Power, where they looked at the power of media, specifically social media, and their ability to influence their peers and the larger world through a single post in both positive and negative ways. Previous topics have been Love and Ain't Easy examines the complexity of love and acceptance in a modern world and the American dream slash nightmare, how the definition of the American dream is very different in our melting pot of America, among many other topics. The teens develop original pieces in dance, acting, and music using the selected topic and then also create an interactive arts-based workshop using the topic that they then tour around Boston to local community centers, libraries, camps, and other programs. On average, they conduct over 30 workshops annually for well over 1,500 children during both the summer program and the school year teen council program. All the teens work together to learn a flash mob dance that they present across the city to an audience of over 25,000 people during a dedicated flash mob day and during their community workshop tour. All of their original artistic work and their workshops come together for a final showcase, which during the summer is a full length, 75 to nine minute production with professional production values on our historic Schubert stage. During the school year, they present a shorter end version of this in the grand lobby of the historic Wang Theater. Teens are taught job readiness and life skills not only through setting high expectations in the workplace, but also through a series of workshops such as financial literacy, networking, resume writing, and mock interviews. In addition, teen leaders hear from the great speakers and guest speakers from a variety of career backgrounds through workshops and weekly what we call power lunches. In the last nine years, we've invested in over 420 youth employment positions, fundraising, and making our own investments totaling $2 million or more in developing leadership in the Boston area teens through the arts. We've had 299 unique teens and have participated in our leadership program, and many of them have participated for consecutive years like Denise has. Where are they now? Well, you will hear from Denise shortly, but as you heard, she's a proud freshman at Howard University. She grew tremendously over the course of three summers of City Spotlights, and I encourage you to ask her directly about her growth. Another student of ours, Jakara, Jakara spent four summers with us and several school year programs with us. She will graduate from the Tisch School at NYU in May with a degree in filmmaking. When she started our program, she was shy and reserved. She had many, hadn't had many arts opportunities and had endured a difficult childhood and home life. She is a gifted writer. She would tell you that during her time with us, she found her voice and most importantly, her courage. She met the Dalai Lama and recited an original poem for him in front of an international audience of over a million people. She pushed her way to NYU even though she was told that she didn't belong there. She found her voice and owns every bit of that voice. She has taken the NYU by storm and has made the most of every opportunity that she's been given and her quote is on the screen. So we've had alumni at Wesleyan, UMass Amherst, UMass Boston, Salem State, Columbia College, Hampshire College, Westville State, Johnson and Wales, Tufts, Boston University, Emerson College, Suffolk University, Currick College, Berkeley School of Music, and obviously Howard University, just to name a few. 
We've had three Posse Scholars, and they are at Denison, Bucknell, and Union, and have had two Gates Millennium Scholars, which are at Harvard and at Boston University. I now invite you to watch a short video that includes scenes from the 2016 City Spotlight's final showcase, which was entitled, interesting, 530 Flight to America, a journey through the perspectives, ideals, and realities of the American dream. to society because the news spits me out as a sculpted beast with zero chains stronger than ever about to bring the pain but just from sitting standing reaching for my license selling CDs playing with a little toy gun or even breathing my voice is always drowning in the pool of sorrow, resentment, and oppression. Racism has not changed, only adding the instrument of recording to illustrate these noble doings. Dear whoever is trying to come to America, listen, America is just a place, but it's a place that gives you more of an opportunity to govern yourself than most others. It can get crappy sometimes, just like anything can. Our government is run by some messed up people, but at least we have the opportunity to choose those messed up people. <laughs> actually goes to show the strength of what these kids create and the subject matters that mean the most to them, the conversation that we were having last night, and how do you translate that in what they do in what we do. And uh, this program not only has changed the lives of a lot of kids in our program, but it has changed the lives of all of us as the staff and as the board, and we're very proud of that. So by the numbers, uh, last year we were in 2019 reaching a little over 20, 24,000, but over the last nine years, that's now 225,000. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, to the stage Denise Woodward and Corey Evans. Hello, my name is Denise Woodard. 
City Spotlights changed the way I think about both myself and the arts. I suffer from a social disability called Asperger's Syndrome, which impairs my ability to read social cues and held me back from making friends as a child and has stunted me in some ways as an adult. Uh, I grew up with a lot of negative thoughts about myself and those spiraled me into a depression around the age of 11. I always used the arts as a hobby, but I didn't see its purpose beyond that besides that and entertainment. As I got older, it got harder for me to manage my emotions. It was a period during 10th grade where I just walked around with storm clouds over my head that only I could see. I didn't really see the point of anything, of school, of the arts, of life. I couldn't act on it and didn't want to talk about it, so I just sat with it for a while until one day I was in the cafeteria and these two girls came up to me and they had done this program called City Spotlights and they were telling me about it. They told me that I would be getting paid to create art and talk about social issues. So I decided I would give it a chance, especially since some of my friends had done it and were gonna do it again. I felt like I would have them you know, as support in case it wasn't as fun. But when I went, I was blown away. It was so much more than I thought it would be. We were doing, not only were we creating art, but we were talking about things that mattered to us. We were going out into the community and doing performances just on the street. We were even doing scenes, which I had never seen done on a street performance. Usually don't see acting done, you know, in a street performance, but we did that too. And on top of that, we got to talk to young children in these community centers about serious topics. We were talking to three to 12 year olds, even teenagers about serious things like mental illness, racism, community violence, all types of things. And we got to feel the pride of knowing that we got them to understand and we got them to have the conversation at such a young age. So this program has taught me a whole lot that arts isn't only a form of entertainment and it's not just something to do. For me, it's a catalyst for change, not only in my life, but in other people's lives. And now uh, I would like to present an excerpt from a song that we wrote in 2018, that summer, for the State House presentation. Uh, this is my part uh, after the course. It's called Lovin' Ain't Easy. <clears throat> Nothing that last comes easy. Got in one little fight, she gon' leave me. This ain't how they made it seem on TV. Never perfect, but it ain't fair how you see me. Trust and believe me, we better as one. Loving with a little drama is better than none. Soon as the storm pass, we back in the sun. So when you see a little rain, don't cancel the fun. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll pass the mic to Corey. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions from council members about the program. Does anyone have um, any questions? I, I will just say, Miles, you have a question. Um, I had the privilege of, of um, going to see this program this summer, and I talked to a lot of the students. I walked around um, when they were working on a specific project and um, was able to talk with a lot of students. And one of the things, um, I think two or three students, oh, well, they weren't students, they were actually teachers, but they had been students. And it was important for them to come back and be teachers because they felt they had learned so much in the program. And um, really just, it was really impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Denise, thank you for that performance. Uh, what takeaway would you have for others or advice you'd have for others going through a youth program? Uh, 
Well, you do have to make the most of it. And um, I just, I just want to say that it's a really great opportunity. Like there's not a whole lot of jobs where you get to actually create things and have agency over what you get to do, you know? Usually when you get a job, minimum wage job, they tell you what to do. It's the same thing over and over again. But with this, with these types of jobs, it's a lot more free. There's still structure, but it's a new thing every day. And it just like pushes you and inspires you. And you, have, you get to have lessons that you can take with you through all aspects of your life. Thank you very much. And I appreciate your thought about self-love as being a really important part of your life, too. Uh, the other qu uh, quick question was, did Joe participate in any of the flash mobs by chance? <laughs> no, I don't know why. I wish he had. <laughs> next year, next year. Next year. Any other questions? Joe, Denise, Corey, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Our next guest is Wendy Levy, Executive Director of the Alliance for Media Arts and Culture. The Alliance for Media Arts and Culture is a national organization that advocates for media arts organizations and artists. One of the ways they've strengthened the field is through their Arts to Work initiative. Arts to Work is a national workforce development plan designed to make media arts more equitable and inclusive for those who have been traditionally excluded from creative careers. Apprenticeship opportunities are available for populations such as veterans, culturally diverse individuals, people with disabilities, women, and high school graduates. Apprentices gain critical editing and producing skills as well as invaluable workplace experience. Here to tell us more about Arts to Work is Wendy Levy. Thank you, Thank you guys. Wendy. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's, I can't tell you how exciting it is to hear someone else talk about Arts to Work um, in such a great way. So whoever wrote that, thank you and thank you. Um, we've been, uh, the Alliance for Media Arts and Culture is going to be 40 years old next year. Um, I've been with the organization about five years now. Um, our mission, as you can see here, is really about advancing the media arts field. And we focus on collaboration, innovation, strategic growth, and cultural impact. We believe that if you want to change the world, you change the stories first. And that artists are the people who really put forward that change in a way that can actually catalyze so many civic shifts and cultural shifts and emotional shifts that we get to where we need to go. And there's very few, there's so many organizations in this room that tend to artists, but when it comes to jobs, we were talking and we've been talking in the field for many years. It's like the starving artist, as you talked about. It's how do we create not only minimum wage jobs, but living wage jobs and real careers with real advancement. So at the Alliance, we think about a world transformed through the power of story. We think of a place where media arts are valued, artists are thriving, and creativity lights the way to justice. And if we think about those in real terms, where we got is that we have got through a series of programs to rethink how we think about the work that artists do. So the Alliance has a few major tent poles. We do creative leadership. We run a leadership lab at Sundance for arts leaders across the country, both emerging and veterans, to really work on change together, strategies for self-preservation and the preservation and growth of their organizations. We do youth media. We have a national youth media network thousands of young people across the country, cities, rural, reservations, wherever young people are creating media, we bring them together. Next week, we're starting a National Youth Media Summit. It's virtual, you can check it out online and join one of the conversations. We have an innovation culture studio to make sure that media arts organizations and storytellers have access to the latest technologies and are not the last ones at the table. So we created an augmented reality app for museums. Those 
um, sometimes very expensive apps where you point them at a, a picture and it comes to life and you get more information. For the longest time, museums and nonprofits were the last people getting access to the newest technology where the stories could live and they could attract audiences and earn revenue streams. And so we made sure that we created an app just for them. Currently, we're working on a web VR project that is gonna create the first web VR museum experience. And we're recreating the Colored Girls Museum in Philadelphia in web VR so that young women and men, everyone could actually experience this incredible museum that's in Philadelphia. A few hundred people get to go maybe every week, and now thousands can go around the world, and those stories can be lifted up. So this is how we talk about stories changing the world. But let's get back to jobs, because Arts to Work is why we're here. Arts to Work is the very first federally registered national apprenticeship program in media arts and creative technology. We wanted to understand why when I picked up the phone to call the U.S. Department of Labor and I asked if they had any apprenticeable positions in media arts, they came back and told me they had bartending. I'm not kidding. And I was like, I gotta talk to somebody about this. And because the, our wonderful colleagues at the Department of Labor were very interested in supporting non-traditional apprenticeships. And I was like, if you can get paid to learn on the job, to be an electrician or a construction worker or to work in manufacturing or healthcare, why, after I went to graduate school, had a film at Sundance and I was a waitress for 20 years, there was no pathway for me to be able to work in the field of my choice. And I'm like, let's change that. So the Department of Labor was generous enough to provide a consultant for the Alliance who worked with us for a year, every week, on the phone. He didn't know as much about digital media, but we held that knowledge. But he knew everything about what we needed to do to get this program through the Department of Labor so that the arts, for the very first time, could participate in the federal creative work, in the workforce system. And so because they provide, if you have a registered apprenticeship program, the employers who hire emerging producers, directors, and editors can receive the same benefits that construction companies receive for hiring young workers and diverse workers and workers of color and veterans. It didn't, there was a disconnect why are we marginalized still when the creative economy, as we know, is real? So now, with Arts to Work, we will launch next month during National Apprenticeship Week, which is November 11th through the 15th. We will have, I think we do have, oh, by the way, here's our, my beautiful staff here and advisors. We have a National Board of Advisors. Um, Sean Jackson does our learning innovation. Christina Ortiz is our founding co-director and on our Board of Advisors. And we now have the very first jobs program for storytellers. So this means that you can earn, you can get hired to learn on the job, to be a producer, to be a director, to be an editor. And these jobs have never, ever been apprenticeable before. And so beginning next month, we have a new website at arts2work.media where any young creative can put in an application. Any business who hires storytellers, and now in the digital age, it's not just for jobs in the arts. This is now also for jobs in, Kaiser is one of, is a, Kaiser Health hires storytellers. The city of Detroit has a chief storyteller. Ad agencies, sports teams, journalism organizations, everybody needs producers, directors, and those who are helping rise up the stories and connect with audiences. So just imagine, so now, instead of working as a waitress and then trying to make your way through a career, you can be mentored, learn on the job, and part of registered apprenticeship is also getting, we have a 2,000 hour program, and on top of that, there is 150 hours of classroom training. So young people can also work towards a community college degree if they would like to. We have a national program that is approved in many states. 
Something about the registered apprenticeship program that folks should know is that it is rigorous. It's not just any company saying, oh, we'll hire you, poor young person. Come, we'll do you a favor. We have to really reimagine what the ecosystem is of the young people coming into this program. They are providing something for companies in this country that has previously been unavailable. This is the voice of those folks who are usually kept to the side, now moving to the center and leading and becoming the next generation of creative employers. This is Saki Bowman. She's our first arts to work apprentice and she's working at Wide Angle Media in Baltimore. She's creating some of the first content, the first videos that will come out about arts to work. We are at the table talking to Google, Pixar, DreamWorks, Lucasfilm. As you can imagine, working with Hollywood has its barriers. But there are over 200 union-run apprenticeships in this country. And we know that we can bring this into the arts. We know that the arts, artists have, these are living wage jobs that you can buy a house with and support a family with. And it's time to end the marginalization of artists by leveraging this incredible workforce system that we have in this country and to make sure that the apprentices of the next generation are also our creative artists. It's a growing national program. And remember, training without a job is a broken promise. When Spike Lee has said himself that if you're not mentoring, you're not doing your job. So we plan to get Spike Lee and his company to be hiring our Arts to Work apprentices as well. And every one of your organizations and your agencies and your cities and our companies should be hiring, training, mentoring, and promoting young people who are the storytellers of tomorrow. So we're thrilled to be the very first federally registered apprenticeship program in media arts. We're working across the country with, we've already been approached by theater companies, by dance companies who would like to participate. And we are thrilled to be able to create a model that we hope we can launch countrywide. So thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Wendy. Are there any questions from the council for Wendy? Wendy, thank you. Wendy, thank you. Thank you so much for your energy uh, that you bring to this topic. One of the questions I had is, what do you see as your biggest challenge going forward in this? Hmm. I'll tell you, we are at a very, very interesting place in the fundraising and development of this program. As you can imagine, I mean, I have thankfully long-standing relationships with the National Endowment for the Arts, the MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, who have generally supported our creative programs. In general, arts funders don't really understand workforce development. And there's a whole new set of standards and data that's required. Workforce funders, we've been getting very involved with the national, the workforce boards and those foundations that are creating you know, anti-poverty programs, they look at me like I am speaking Martian when I start talking about registered apprenticeships in the arts. They're like, Wendy, we, we fund programs for welders and electricians and construction workers. I'm like, why not producers? Why not editors? These are living wage jobs. And so we've been actually rejected from the first five or six grants that we submitted for workforce, even though we're registered apprenticeship. Because I know that those panels that decide on those grants are construction workers. They don't understand our programs. So we've been going, I've been going to legislators, we've been going into those panels, and I've been begging. I mean, I learned how to write a less flowery grant proposal, right? My grant proposals are visionary, and we're changing the world, and here's our creative programs, and I've learned the hard way how to scale it back. We're going to train these many people. They're going to make this much money. They will be promoted after their jobs, and Luckily, I think we may have primed the pump. The state of Pennsylvania gave us our first PA SMART grant to start a pre-apprenticeship program there. Um, this training is not cheap. Digital media, we need the technology. We need to make sure. It's like construction apprentices need construction boots. Our apprentices need laptops. Have you, gotten, have you gotten a lot of support from the creative economy sector? You would think they would jump in on this. So far, so good. They've invited, I, there was one slide where all the places where I get to 
be invited to go speak, and they do. Thankfully, the enthusiasm for the program has been great. We want to, once we can translate it into dollars and cents, we have one of the, a former vice president of the MacArthur Foundation is on our board of advisors, and I said, Elspeth, I want to try to raise a million dollars in the first year, and so at least we can get going. She goes, Wendy, go for 10 go for $10 million, because then we can start to be sustainable. Um, I am just allowed right now to say we have a grant pending with the state of Georgia that is being um, shepherded by the Arthur Blank Foundation for $1.8 million to launch Arts to Work in Georgia, and because they really see the value of the creative economy, and that will go to benefit from K-12 all the way through veterans returning home. So I hope you're right. I hope well, you're right. Thank you very much. And with your energy, I have no doubt. You'll thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Wendy, I just want to say thank you to you and your staff. You know, the, the Alliance has really flourished and nurtured so many people over the years. And, and I really appreciate your work. And uh, thank you. we will find ways to work together. Thank you so much. I can't wait for that. So I, I think if I was you, I would direct it towards Sony and to Tom. We have refused to be in Okay. Well, that's, I don't know what you actually expect us to do. He's a board member. He's not here today. He can't respond to that, and I can't respond for him. Please so thank you. Supporting the arts means supporting the artists. Thank you. Yes. We agree. I have another question Art for the presenter. Um, for Wendy? For Wendy, yes. Oh, perfect. Wendy, I'm Sorry. a visual artist and I was interested in the apps for museums. Which museums carry your, have, have used your apps? Well, our app actually is, we Can everyone hear me? Let me go back. Hold. Thank you. So far, we are now in a training period with museums um, across the country. We uh, have just come from the Smithsonian uh, talking to them. They have Hershorn Eye. Uh, when we introduced our app, they're like, oh, this is very, very interesting. We're working now with cities and museums. I would say, I don't think maybe, I don't think anyone has actually launched the work that they have prototyped with the app, but we're in 2020, on our 40th anniversary, we're doing a National Day of Storytelling at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, and we hope to launch our 25 Museum Initiative there. So it should be almost every museum that we're working with, which is, there's a list of 25. So if we, I'm happy to send it to you in, uh, um, afterwards, and maybe we can get together on that. Thank you. Okay. Good luck. Yeah. Our next presenter is Julia Levy, not related to Wendy Levy. <laughs> she is um, executive director of Roundabout Theater Company. As I mentioned earlier, Roundabout has undertaken truly pioneering work in terms of career development. Their theatrical workforce development program has been heralded as diversifying Broadway's backstage world, which has historically been largely male and largely white. In partnership with the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, which is a stage hands union, this initiative is designed to open new career pathways for women, for people of color, and for veterans. The program provides three years of job training and pays participants while they learn the trade, setting them up, setting them up to successfully pursue a sustainable livelihood in the theater. Please join me in welcoming Julia Levy. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Carter, for inviting me to represent Roundabout and have the opportunity to speak to you all about the work that we've been doing over the past probably eight years now on developing this program and then launching it three, 
just three years ago. Um, we've had a long history with the NEA, a storied history, some might say. Uh, we were founded in the same year, 1965. We went from a small off-Broadway theater company uh, in Chelsea that had, uh, I think, 150 subscribers who paid $5 for their subscription to now the largest not-for-profit theater in the country with a budget over $65 million, operating uh, three Broadway theaters and one off-Broadway theater complex that includes a 400-seat off-Broadway theater and a 65-seat uh, uh, experimental theater for new writers who have never been produced before in New York City. A um, couple of the, the most recent plays that the NEA has supported uh, speaks to the, the way Roundabout's mission has grown from doing predominantly classic plays to now supporting young and established living writers. Uh, Lydia Diamond wrote a play called Tony Stone that is now in San Francisco. After launching at Roundabout, it was commissioned by us, and it's a fascinating play about the first woman who was black who played in the professional baseball league. It was the Negro Baseball League, and it's a wonderful story. Um, took about eight years to get to the stage. And then, as well, recently, a play called Amy and the Orphans, which is by one of our young writers from the underground program, Lindsay Varentino, that was a very personal story about her aunt who had Down syndrome and was sent to an institution. And this play featured uh, the first, actually starred, the first actor with sound, excuse me, Down syndrome on stage in New York. Um, so thank you for that support. Through the years, the NEA has also supported our education program uh, from which Workforce grew. And that was started in 19, yeah, 1996 as a program that was really focused on partnership, partnership with teachers, partnership with schools. It was about quality programming, not necessarily quantity program. Um, so going back to getting specific about TWDP, which is what we call theater workforce, technical theater workforce program, we are really, really thrilled to be co-hosting with Ford Foundation and really um, uh, from, it, from the very beginning, the NEA, to share best practices in workforce development. Big shout out to Greg Reiner, who about a year ago actually took the call and said, sure, let's meet and discuss how we can bring the community together. Because this program is not just for theater, it's for every cultural institution. And in fact, since we launched, we've had opera companies, dance companies, presenting organizations, the Smithsonian. So it is not just for the performing arts, it's also the visual arts have come to us to express their interest in learning more and how can they launch their own program. Um, and that's what really spearheaded this idea of having it a convening. The program itself is about providing a pathway into middle class, middle skill jobs for underemployed communities. It's about identifying more diverse populations for what has been a traditionally white, as, as Marianne said, white and male dominated industry. It's also about a growing industry. Our industry, and again, this is not just for the performing arts, this covers Wendy's world, it's the film world, it is baseball stadiums, it is concert venues, it is uh, Carnival Cruise Lines. That's an incredible growing industry for which we need to be building a workforce because our current workforce, as we've learned from uh, our union, is aging out and new people are not coming in. Um, so it's about making sure we have a pipeline for new populations to come into what has traditionally been a population or a workforce grown through nepotism. Our program just finished its three-year pilot phase. It was designed as a three-year program. Uh, there are handouts we did provide which give you some background on who our, our uh, uh, targeted population is, and then also from our assessment partner, we brought in Public Works at the very beginning to work with us because we wanted to make sure that the program we were building was going to be successful for the young people who were brave enough to come in and partner with us to develop this program because they're as, as important to the development of the program as those of us at Roundabout who were involved with it. So it's a three-year program, and our goal was that at the end of the program, at the end of three years, our fellows would either be working in the field and gainfully employed with perhaps a pathway to the union, but not necessarily, or they would go to college. 
the the program um, so the first year of the program, I'll go through that really quickly because I think what I want to focus on and some of the questions we've heard from the field is how has this worked? How did we develop it? What were the stumbling blocks? What were the challenges as we were building it? So the first year, uh, and it's all by application, it's a very rigorous uh, interview process. For us, our target population is 18 to 24 year old, New York City, you have to be a New York City resident, high school graduates or GED equivalent and 18 to 24 year old out of work. Um, so the, they go through an application process. It begins in January. By April, we have identified and invited. Our first cohort was just 12. Um, we were hoping for 15, but we had 12 members who joined in the first year. In the first year, they are paid minimum wage, which in New York is now $15 an hour, and they're guaranteed 30 hours of work with us. It's very, very important, which is what distinguishes us as a workforce program. We pay. That was actually, it's interesting talking to funders, that was one of the big workforce funders. They didn't understand why we were paying these young people. And we explained this is a full-time three-year program. And it's, they can't afford not to work. They don't have the resources to be able to uh, uh, participate in this program. So paying was, was very important. So in the first year they're with us, um, in partnership with IATSE, the union, they each get a union member as a mentor. And that mentor commits to working with them one day a month and following them for the three years of the program. That was a key element because mentorship is so important to any workforce program. And in particular, in this union, it has been through nepotism. It's who you know is how you get the job. So that was a key element. So they're with us. They're, they're touring other Broadway theaters. They are going to NBC, local WNBC, to tour to be exposed to you don't just have to work in theater. Um, at the end of the first year, we then have employment partners, which also was a huge challenge for us. We want them employed in the field with us, continuing to participate with the fellows and meeting with them. Uh, so they work. We've identified partners, and two outstanding partners have been the Public Theater and the Atlantic Theater. They agree to employ our students for, excuse me, our fellows for one full year and give them a minimum of 30 hours a week. At the end of that second year, and again, mentors are following him at the uh, third year, the, stu the fellows are now out in the field, and they are working toward getting full-time jobs. Um, we just ended year three uh, of our program, and of those, 92% are working in the field, gainfully employed, and one decided to go on to college, which to us is a success. Beyond that, something we never dreamed of, we were told when we first started this program that uh, the union felt that maybe in five or ten years one of our fellows would be able to sit for the apprentice program, uh, apprentice test to get into the union. And in fact, they held eight spots of the 200 that they have for young people to, or anyone to take the test. They held eight spots for us. And one of our uh, first year fellows, Isaac, who also is trans, um, was invited to join the union. And he is now a full-fledged union member working on Beetlejuice and Moulin Rouge. Yeah, exactly. In addition to that, we have hired one of our second year. Roundabout has hired one of our second year fellows. And they are now an apprentice in our black box. So two of them, um, beyond what we ever anticipated, are now in the union and also working full time for us. Um, so now that I've gone through the program, oh, sorry, uh, I've gone through the program. I also want to show you a little bit, very, very short video um, that'll give you a sense of who some of these fellows are and uh, what the work they were trained to do is.
So that just gives you a little taste of, of who these young people are. And I smile because, as Joe said, these young people have changed us as much as their lives have changed by being a part of this program and now having real middle class, middle skill jobs. Um, so going back to why, um, why is this program successful? Why did we start it to begin with? And I think the, or I know the reason it's successful is because it grew organically out of the work we were doing with young people. We have everything that we've done in our education program has grown out of what we've learned from these young people and what we've seen the need is to continue their enthusiasm and interest in the arts. And we have an after school program called Roundabout Youth Ensemble that actually the NEA has supported, so thank you very much, where students come from all our partner schools, from all five boroughs, they gather at our black box, and they create, they are in charge of their own learning. They work together for a full year, and then in the summer they produce their own show using us as mentors. But it's their writing, it's their directing, it's their lighting, it's their sound, they're hanging the lights, they're doing it all. Um, so what we found was we were turning these young people onto theater and working in theater, but what was happening to them once they left high school? And some of them were being gobbled up by these proprietary schools, which is a disaster for young, um, young people in public schools where they're sucked into paying $5,000 for a nothing education and they end up in debt with no skills and no job afterward. And we really wanted to figure out how can we help those who don't want to go to college for whatever, college is not for everybody. So what can we do to help create a workforce program and help them stay in theater? And that's where the workforce program what began, the idea began, and I, I should stop and say Jennifer DeBella, our education director, is the brains behind this program. It was her idea. So she started to talk with IATSE, the union, to say, is there some way they have an education division? Would you work with us to start to expose these young people to programs, or excuse me, to jobs, to lighting, sound, stage hands? costume, makeup, these are the trades that we were looking to engage these young people in. And it took a lot of convincing, but they agreed we now have a program which is called Hidden Career Paths which starts in high school. Ninth through 12th graders from our partner schools are invited in. They spend a, an entire afternoon on site at Roundabout and then touring commercial productions and getting a real sense to touch some of the lighting equipment and touch the sound equipment and do makeup and learn from Wicked how you make the face green and then get to walk around with it all day long. Um, we knew the program was going to need major buy-in, not just from our external stakeholders like IATSE and um, uh, the students as well, because this was brand new. There is no program like this in the country. Uh, and we also knew internally we needed our board. We needed our own stagehands who are members of the union. We needed our general managers and production managers to buy into this program because they were going to be necessary as our partners in this program. So we spent a lot of time. We probably spent as much time convincing and work, not con I shouldn't say convincing, but bringing IATSE up to speed and who these students were and the incredible talent that they have and how they can be a meaningful part of our industry. Um, we spent that much time with our board getting their buy-in because we didn't know where the funding was going to come. We thought this was going to cost us about $250,000 a year and who was going to fund that. Um, so we spent about the same amount of time with both. And then we spent a lot of time thinking about how are we going to make sure the program is right because these young people's lives are, are important. They're important to them, they're important to us, to their families, and quite frankly, we didn't want to screw it up and end the three years with them having nothing to do. Um, so it was, that was, I think, the three reasons why this program was successful. Um, Sorry, I get ahead of myself sometimes. Um, I think the union was a really big deal um, in, in having them in partnership with us really turned people on to the program. It got our board excited about what we were doing and it helped with our internal 
stakeholders like our production managers when they knew that their union was going to be um, as supportive of this program as our, our education team was. Um, one of the other uh, challenges we ran into, which was why it was so important to take the two years we did to actually develop the program was, as Wendy, Wendy pointed out, a lot of funders were very skeptical about this program. Uh, it was very expensive. Um, they didn't understand why it had to be three years. They didn't understand uh, why we were paying students. They didn't understand why the union was not just taking this over and paying for it. And it, it took, we spent, during that two-year development phase, we took time working with a think tank. We were invited to participate in a think tank in New York run by Jobs First. And they helped us develop a program that was very, very different from what we started with. We didn't understand that we needed these young people who are going to be thrown into this gig economy, not a full-time job, not someplace where they're going to get a W-2 at the end of the year of work outlining how much money they made. And we were encouraged to partner with a social service organization that was well-versed in working with young people. And they turned us on to an organization called The Door. And they have been with us since day one. That's a huge part of the success is partnering with, with them. They have one person, Tina, who's embedded in our program. They actually have, she has a desk in our office. And her job is to help them figure out how do you work in a world where you're 18 to 24 years old and you're going to be working for somebody, and to be totally blunt, you're going to be working with some old white guy who's going to tell you, go fetch me coffee, go do this, go do that. How do I navigate that as a young person of color? Because most of our people, are, our fellows, are people of color. How do I navigate this world? Um, how do I write checks? How do I keep a bank account? How do I plan for my taxes? They actually will do the taxes with the students. They offer tax preparation, which was really essential. So learning that from Jobs First was amazing. Um, and so it took a lot of time to get other, to get private funders engaged in this. And a, another issue, I think the, the partnering with the union was a big deal because so many of the workforce funders had never heard of an employer partnering with the unions. And that started to open doors for us. That was a big piece of why uh, places like Pinkerton, which don't necessarily, foundation don't necessarily support the arts, but support workforce development programs, came on board and said, yes, we'll support your program. And they have been with us since day one. Uh, so that was, a, that was a game changer for us. Um, and then I think the, the idea that we wanted to really monitor this program and get real real time feedback on how the program worked is another reason why it became so successful for us. Now we're faced with, so we've got this wonderful program. It's three years. We have 74 fellows who have graduated from our program. We have our new cohort uh, out of that pilot phase. We've started cohort four. Now what? And through the past couple of years, um, we've had, as I mentioned, a number of inquiries. And we've really struggled with how do we scale? Because if we're only bringing 20 young people into the field, we're not going to change the field fast enough. And, and something I should have said at the very beginning is, is while it wasn't what motivated us to do the program, it is, it is valuable for our field to help create more opportunities for young people of color to enter this, this field. Because right now, you know, if you go to theater now in Hamilton, God, nobody said it better than Hamilton, you look at what's happening on stage, and there, there are baby steps that have been taken on stage in diversifying the kind of work that we're seeing on stage, writers and so forth, but you look backstage, and it's still white, so what can we do about that? And that's another reason why workforce has become such a, a 
profound program for our field and people want to learn about it. So we looked at how can we scale, how can we go into other communities, and that was simply not an option as we realized we don't have the capacity to do that. And that's where this convening comes in and why it's so critical for the next phase of this program because we want to be able to, in a large, in a, a much larger venue, in a much larger cohort, create a group of people throughout disciplines who are looking to develop workforce programs and the populations can also be different. It doesn't have to be high school graduates. If you don't have an education program, then you're not going to start a program targeted high school uh, graduates. So it was actually the NEA who, who brought up what about veterans? Why couldn't veterans be a part of this program? Uh, Ford Foundation brought up to us as part of this convenient, we need to have a space for people with disabilities because that is a group that can be part of this. And in fact, in our first cohort, we had two young people who, who self-identified as people with autism. And they have gone through the program and they're working in the field. So that needs to be a conversation. And our hope is the outcome of this NEA convening will be the first cohort of performing arts and visual arts organizations that together will continue to work together to share best practices and develop a new workforce for the next 10, 20 years that looks very, very different than the current workforce we have. Thank you. Do any members have a question for Julia? Thank you so much for presenting on the program. It's so ambitious, <clears throat> and I can see how much time and effort and thought went into it. I wondered, on the case and the discussion about how you tried to train the students to understand and be aware of diversity and bias and maybe the feelings of hierarchy or power, what kind of training was happening on the other side for those that were mentoring? Because I think in these cases, in all of the workforce cases, it's as much about the giver as it is the receiver and vice versa. Absolutely, and very, very good question. We work very, very closely, and, and I should uh, shout out as well to Pat White, who is vice president of IATSE and also head of the uh, uh, costume, yeah, wardrobe union in New York. And this was something that she took very seriously, and it is very much a collaboration between our organizations um, of having the mentors who are trained, who are, and they volunteer for this. They are not appointed, they volunteer for this. And as much of them learning and all of us together learning. So they work with Tina, oops, sorry, that shut off. Oh no, there we go. Um, they work with Tina from the door. She is very much a part of the training. And I will also say, Deepa, what's, what's so exciting about this program, and Joe spoke to this as well, it's changed us. It's changed how we think and work and move forward with hiring more artists of color, of hiring more technicians of color, and helping us be more, I guess, fluent and more understanding and being more sensitive. So it is changed us. We have, we developed an EDI statement three years ago as a re result of these young people. So they're also teaching us. And I think that is the most profound impact this has had on Roundabout. And these young people are extraordinary, are extraordinary young people. So they're changing us and they're helping us change our language and change our thinking. Julia, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> the Arts Endowment is also hoping to create professional opportunities for the next generation of artists. One way we've been pursuing this is through our Musical Theater Songwriting Challenge. This program invites high school students from around the country to submit an original song that they've written either on their own or with an artistic collaborator. We launched this program in 2016 in partnership with the American Theater Wing, and I'd like to take a quick moment to recognize Megan Jensen, Director of Programs for the Wing, who is with us today from New York. Megan, thank you. <laughs> Megan and her team are extraordinary partners for the Songwriting Challenge. This year, we received 170 submissions from 40 states. 
In the end, we chose five individuals and one duo as our six regional finalists, all of whom were paired with a musical theater mentor and music director. These professionals worked with students to hone all parts of their song, from lyrics to orchestration to arrangement. The teams met virtually and also in person when the mentors and music director traveled to the winner's hometowns for three-day on-site workshops. This gave students a chance to really see the nitty-gritty behind-the-scenes work of musical theater and to learn what it takes to succeed as a professional artist. Last week, all the winners spent two days in New York recording a cast album which will be available on streaming sites like iTunes and Spotify in December. Here to tell us about her experience is one of our, is our final presenter, 2019 Musical Theater Songwriting Challenge regional winner, Breezy Love. Breezy is from Winnetka, Illinois, and is a senior at Interlochen Arts Academy. Throughout the Songwriting Challenge, she worked with mentors Patrick Sulkin, and Cesar Alvarez, who helped her workshop her song, Hanging on Life. Please join me in welcoming Breezy Love. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's really amazing to be here. I'm a small town girl from outside of Chicago, and to be here doing a presentation for a government program like the National Endowment for the Arts is pretty unfathomable for an 18-year-old girl. So thank you so much for having me. A 
I'm reaching for something, getting handfuls and handfuls of air. Someday I'm gonna take back my control Cause I'm hanging on life for today For today, for today so much. I'll see, I'll see if the council has any questions, but, um, but I was thrilled on um, this past Monday I was able to be in New York and the, um, the six finalists had all gathered together Sunday and Monday to have their um, songs professionally recorded and that will be turned into an album. And uh, Samuel French will also publish it, which will be very nice. But it was amazing to see the bond the students formed almost immediately. And uh, we just, we had so much fun. It was really, um, it was really just a, um, just a great honor to watch all of you. And so thank you to all the students and all the parents, and your parents in particular, who are sitting here um, in the front row. So thank you all. Hi, Mom and Dad. <laughs> Um, any questions for Breezy? And by the way, with a name like Breezy Love, how can you not be a star? <laughs> That's a great name. My mom name. picked out yeah. Breezy for me. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> any questions? Breezy. Breezy, thank you so much for that performance. The question is, what was the uh, big takeaway you had throughout the songwriting challenge? It's a surprise that you didn't expect. I'd say the biggest takeaway was just how big this industry is, and I don't have to be limited to one certain type of songwriting. Um, I study songwriting at Interlock and Arts Academy, and I focus heavily on my own songwriting process and my own career and trying to make these songs that really impact me. And a lot of my early songwriting was very, um, you know, just for my own personal, you know, just having this song that affects me. But going to the songwriting program and getting to work with Patrick and Cesar, what I realized was I want to write songs that affect people in massive audiences. And when I heard Jesse Sulkin, which was the Broadway star that was able to sing my song, um, perform and make it her own and take every little lyric that I had written and interpret it in her own certain way, it brought me to tears. I was in the studio just crying because I could see how it affected someone else and the song you know, touch someone else's heart. And that's what the kind of writing I want to do. And um, I'm so thankful to the National Endowment of the Arts and the American Theater Wing for creating a competition that enables me as an artist to discover these things. And I'm, I can go throughout my career now and have this insight of what's my general goal, what's my thesis statement as an artist. And I really just want to make songs that affect people and that they can make their own. Thank you very much. And Patrick. And Patrick, thank you for your collaboration with this. I'm sure you both have made an amazing team. Thank you. Okay. As our final piece of business, I am pleased to announce that the National Council on the Arts has reviewed the applications presented to them, and a tally of the council members' ballots reveals that all recommendations for funding and rejection have passed. Are there any additional comments, questions, or discussions from our council members? No. I again would like to thank Dorothy and her team for their gracious hospi hospitality and for welcoming us to this beautiful museum. The 198th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.